Well, I hope that you've already had enough compelling reasons to step into a group. Super grateful for Brian and Jack and Catherine and Jane. I got to be a part of that group, as you saw, and just uh, I love, to their point, what, what goes on from the first night until the last night. It's just incredible, and that's available for you, but you might still be thinking there are some reasons, Ben, that you don't understand. I don't need to be in a group, so I, w- I just want to debunk three of your reasons. You cool with that? You've got an argument, you're not saying it out loud, but I already read it in your mind. So the first argument you have is this, Ben, my life is busy, I don't have time for this. Your life is busy, that is true. But what is also true is that you and I make time for what matters, and this really matters. Number two reason you might not want to join Ben, I really don't need any people in my life. Um, My response to that is, Jesus needed people, so do you. The third thing you might say is, Ben, I'm not sure I want people to get to know the real me. I totally get that. In a world where we're tempted to care about our appearance more than our substance, let me say this to you. Please start caring more about who you actually are than who everyone thinks you are. This is available to you. It's available to you. It's kind of like parenting, right? It's like we have created this great environment for you to step into, but we don't have control over you, and we wouldn't want that. But there's something on the other side. And guys, I just believe with all my heart, those of you watching at home and in this room, I believe we're weeks and and, and just maybe a month or two between a lot of things being wide open. And I just want to encourage you, it's time. It's time to move forward. And you can't do that by yourself. There will be so much missing if you try to move forward by yourself. For today, I will never forget the first time I had an employee take time off of work for a self care day. I'm thinking, a, a, a what? Is there something wrong with you? D- don't you love your job? Don't you care about the calling that God has given us? And I literally had this thought, I'm sure that person doesn't care about the mission as much as I do. And all of you are thinking, I'll never work for that guy. <laughs> Thankfully, I've learned this. If you really care about the mission God has given you, you'll need to take care of yourself. There's a word for some of us today. I am ready to preach. I know, listen, I get it. Like, I haven't preached a lot over the last two months. It's been so great to hear from many and Will and Atul and Shauna. You're stuck with me today. All right? You're stuck with me today. But I am ready. And I believe God's got something to say to us. So let me just repeat that. If you really care... And by the way, you should really care about the mission God has given your life. And by the way, he's given you a mission. Then you've got to take care of yourself. I had to ask myself a question that I want to ask you today. It's a question you really need to answer. Not with condemnation, but really with a decision that we want to do things differently moving forward. The question is this. How much damage have you done to yourself and to others because you haven't adequately cared for yourself? How much damage do you think you've done to yourself and to others because you just haven't adequately cared for yourself? Now, before you start thinking I'm talking only about one thing today, let me say this. Self-care is not meant to be an end in itself. Self-care is not meant to be an end. It is a means. Say that with me out loud. Self-care is a means. Self-care? It is a means to another end, which is living the life you were intended to live and fulfilling the purpose for which God sent you to this earth. That's the point of self-care. So the question you should be asking, and I want to answer today, is how do we take care of ourselves without becoming obsessed with ourselves? How do, we, how do I take care of myself, Ben Pilgrim? How do you take care of yourself without becoming obsessed with yourself? No surprise, but I'm calling today's message self-care or self-obsession. Self-care or self Obsession. We'll get back into the Gospel of Mark in just a moment, chapter 6, verse 30, for those of you that want to get ahead. If you've not been tracking with us or you're here for the first time, in September we started walking through the Gospel of Mark. There are four Gospels in what we call the New Testament of the Bible, and we've been learning so much about Jesus and what he wants for our lives as we've walked through this. And in a moment we'll get to Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 34, but I really need to let you know what's been happening as we walk into this moment today. Shauna did a brilliant job last week telling us that Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs so that they might preach the good news, that they, they might cast out demons, and that they might heal the sick. So they've done that, and you can imagine how exhausted they are after a mission journey like that. Well, between that and today, something else has happened. Jesus and his disciples have gotten word that John the Baptist has been beheaded. 
John the Baptist is Jesus' first cousin. John the Baptist is the forerunner to the ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist had some of Jesus' disciples as his own disciples. John the Baptist is the one who uh, baptized Jesus. And John the Baptist is beheaded. So just imagine the combination. Sheer exhaustion and deep grief. That is a brutal combination, and it is one that many of us have been in often over these last couple of years. And so just imagine the level of exhaustion from doing crazy amounts of work and imagine the kind of grief that you would be going through if someone that meant a whole lot to you had not only died but had been murdered in this quite brutal way. With that background, let's stand as I read just five verses for us today. Mark 6, 30 through 34. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Some of you, that's all you need to have today. But we go on. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And I believe today he wants to teach us many things. Will we be about self-care for the sake of mission or self-obsession for the sake of ourselves? Have a seat, and I believe there's so much gold in here. And some of you, if you read the heading, you know that I didn't get into the next part because I'm saving the next part. The next part is where Jesus goes on to feed 5,000 men plus women and children, maybe 15 to 20,000 people. I am saving that part of Mark for February 13th, which is the day we literally turn 11 years old as a church. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I think we're the only thing still in Soma that's open. (laughs) And that's pretty amazing. Strong church. I'm calling that message, though, and I'm really excited about it. I'm calling that message more than enough. And on that day, you need to know there's more than enough space to bring your friends with you. For those of you that have still been at home for two years waiting to circle a day, next week is great, January 30th. But if not, then go ahead and circle February 13th. That day, we have more than enough sweet treats for you, and that day, we have more than enough brand new epic t-shirts that no one, including myself, has yet, and we're going to give one to everyone who is there in person on that day. So February 13th, the birthday. So the disciples come back, and they report to Jesus, we've done all of these things, and here's the stuff that we taught, just like you told us to. And even as they're giving Jesus a report, it seems from the text like they're interrupted by the crowd continuing to come. And there were so many people coming and going that the disciples didn't even have time to eat. Have you ever been in a season like that? Have you ever been in a season or are you in a season right now where you don't even have time to eat? You don't even have time to take your spouse on a date. You don't even have time to play with your kids. You don't even have time to catch up with your friends, and it feels like you don't even have time to pray. You ever been in a season like that? The disciples are in that kind of moment, and Jesus realizes that something needs to be done. And here's what Jesus knows. Jesus knows he must sustain us if we're going to fulfill our mission in life. Jesus knows that he must sustain us if we're going to fulfill our mission in life. Now, what's interesting is, who gives us our mission? Jesus gives us our mission... But at times, he's going to call call us to disengage from the very mission he's giving to us so that we can stay fully engaged in the mission itself. He's going to call us to disengage, then he's going to call us to engage. And if you don't know how to disengage so that you might engage, so that you might disengage, so that you might engage, I promise you, you're not going to be able to carry out what God has for you to do. It just won't be sustained. Now, the disciples, when they're coming to report back to Jesus, imagine that's you. Right? I mean, who loves a performance review when you've been a miserable failure? Nobody. But when you've had success, what, who loves that review? Like you are walking in there, chest is out, you're like, I know. Tell me how awesome I am. I'm ready. The disciples, this is the moment I'm going to preach to you in a few weeks about when they didn't have a success, right? When they could not cast out a demon. 
We'll talk about that in a few weeks. But, but this is a moment where they've had success. Jesus, we did what you told us to do. They want to give a report. And as they're giving their successful, glowing report, all of a sudden, people keep coming. And now they've got more time for opportunities of ministry. Yet, it's in that very reality that Jesus says, listen, too much is too much. And you just need to ask yourself that question, when is too much just too much? And as Jesus gives the disciples an invitation, I want you to receive it word for word as an invitation to you today. Word for word, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me to a, by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. We'll just do four phrases, break down. Come with me. You guys, disengagement is not just about watching a movie, though that's fine. It's not just about downtime. It's not just about relaxing. It's not even just about solitude, though we'll talk about that in just a moment. Come with me is what Jesus is saying. I don't want you just to disengage all by your lonesome. I want you to be with me. Let me ask you a question. Are you being with Jesus or only doing for Jesus? We all have a default on this one. You see it in Mary and Martha's story. And just in case you don't know how I'm wired, my default is to just do the doing. The other has to be disciplined. It's had, it has had to be structured into and out of me. I don't know about which way you lean. Come with me, but that phrase, by yourselves. By, by yourselves. If your vocation involves impacting people, customers, clients, the children you're raising, the, the, the work that you do here as a leader at Epic Church. If your work involves impacting people, the thing that you probably believe is that I can't be away from these people because people are my mission. Anybody, any part, part of your life, please raise your hand. Please, everybody raise your hand, all of you at home as well. Anybody have a mission or a calling that involves impacting anybody else? Raise them high, just so we're really clear. And what we think, because we have such a calling to so many people, or even a few people, we think we can never be away from those people. It's counterintuitive, but it's true. If you will have healthy rhythms of disengagement, when you come back and engage with the very people you've been sent to this earth to serve, you will be way better to impact them than if you just stay with them the whole time. Guys, for me, I... I'm grateful for God's calling on my life. He has given me leadership of a lot of different people in a lot of different spaces. Obviously, you would be aware that this church and the congregation would be a huge part of that for me. But what goes up, my impact goes up whenever I'm in a faithful season of regular disengagement and engagement. I need that, and so do you. It's kind of like the couple who don't think they can go out on a date night because they have no one to care for their kids. I'm here to tell you, if you prioritize your marriage more than your parenting and you go on that date night, when you get back with your kids, you'll be a way better mom and dad. That's for free. But it's true. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Our world is a noisy place. And on top of that, we invite so much extra noise into our lives. The psalmist said, my soul finds rest in God alone. There are some things God will only be able to do in you in the quiet and stillness. There are some gifts that I and you can only receive when we slow things down a little bit. When I taught on solitude early in Mark's gospel, I gave you this verse in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, but it's worth visiting again. Jesus knew quiet was important for him. Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a what place? To a solitary place where he just binged on Netflix? What did he do? He, he prayed. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. How are you removing the noise from your life? How are you removing the noise from your life? And secondarily, how are you removing yourself from the noise? So we have jurisdiction of things we act like we have no control over, so we can remove some noise from our lives. And guys, we also have to realize that it's up to us to at times do what Jesus did and remove ourselves from the noise. I'm guessing, and I'll only confess for myself, not for you, I'm guessing many of us need to change the relationship we have with our phones. 
Let me give you just a practical, just a few things practically for your phone. Number one, it is possible not to look at your phone until you've spent time in the presence of Jesus every morning. No amens. You don't believe it. With God, all things are possible. It is also possible in the evening to put your phone to bed before you put yourself to bed. And just very practically, if you're an iPhone user, the latest iOS, they've helped us. They've given us focus mode. Anybody using focus mode yet? Oh, my goodness. I can now tell you, so you're not wondering, does Ben hate me when I don't respond to your text messages? Oh, user has silenced notifications. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Here's what I believe. This is true. If you have zero boundaries with your phone, there is no way you are completely leaning into and living out the vision God has for your life. There's no way. It's impossible. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. I love Psalm 131 verses 1 and 2. The psalmist says this. This is one you need to memorize. This helped me early in the pandemic. It has carried me through. Here's what he says. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am. We keep telling ourselves, no, no, no. I need to keep concerning myself with all the things all the time. Can I get a witness? What happens in the next three seconds if I'm not on Twitter? If I don't refresh the news. No, no, no. I'm not looking for a dopamine fix. I I, I am quieting. I'm learning how to quiet myself and wean myself off of those things. And surprise, surprise, I have a deeper sense of contentment as I do that. And what I'm advocating here, remember, Jesus isn't advocating that they go into a monastic lifestyle. Wait till they get to the place on the other side of the lake. They're right back in the game. But he's just saying you got to have some kind of rhythm of quiet and disengagement. And then that last part, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some, get some rest. My soul finds rest in God alone. What is your soul finding rest in? Or what is keeping your soul from finding rest? Hey, think about this. One of God's greatest gifts to us is sleep. And though he keeps giving us that invitation on a daily basis, we can ignore it, can't we? It doesn't matter what research is saying, and by the way, it's saying we all need more sleep. And then God goes ahead and he prescribes a weekly Sabbath for us, but we can neglect it. Guys, one of the best books I've read on what we're talking about today is a book called The Contemplative Minister by Ian Cowley, C-O-W-L-E-Y. And you don't need to be a vocational pastor to get a lot out of this book. But here's what he he says about this idea. He says, in such demanding context, pause for a moment. Is fulfilling your mission in a city like San Francisco a demanding context? Okay, so we're all in that. In such demanding context, unless we are deeply sustained by the resources which only Christ can give us, we are all too likely to lose our way and perhaps even our... If we don't... Let Jesus sustain us. We will have to forfeit fulfilling his mission with our lives. Anybody know anyone in ministry or medicine or education that could not finish living out their calling because they didn't have the resources to sustain them long term? Anybody? I mean, think about how many people just don't finish well. There was nothing wrong with the calling. There was nothing wrong with their work ethic. They just never disengaged and allow themselves to be filled back up. So let me ask you this question. What rhythms do you need to put in place to sustain your mission in life? What rhythms do you need to put in place to sustain your mission in life? It sounds like a self-serving question. Would you agree? But it isn't because my mission is never about me. There are rhythms you and I need to put into place so that we can sustain the mission that God has given us. Shauna and I are grateful for what God has called us to do. 97% of the time. We're grateful. She loves writing books. She loves leading Alpha. She loves 
speaking here and at other churches. She loves loving our neighborhood and our neighbors. She is doing all of that. I love leading this church. I love preaching. I love the Bring It Out podcast. I love the Bring It Out course. I love coaching ministry leaders and business leaders. I love it. And more than all of those things, we actually love raising four teenagers when we travel around the nation. People give me their shock face when they hear where we live separately, San Francisco, or when they ask about our family. You have how many what? Like, I know four teenagers in San Francisco. We're so grateful for our callings, but listen to me really clearly. Because of what Jesus has called us to do, we have to have rhythms to sustain that mission. What we need, and you make your own list, some of them will be overlapping, and please make a list. Here's what we need. Borrow them, make up your own. We need a weekly Sabbath. We need a weekly date day or a date night. We need time away as a family of six, and we need time away as a couple. Our kids need one-on-one time from us. We need a home that feels like a refuge. We need close friends that we don't have to just be their pastor. We can just be friends. Okay? We need boundaries. We need to say no a ton of times so we can keep saying the yeses Jesus has for us. What do you need to sustain your mission? Please do this work this week. What season am I in? What has God called me to do? What rhythms must I have? What are the things that people might even be upset that I say no to them, but it's so that I can say the yes? This is a vital question you should be asking. Because here's what we've got to know. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. But if your purpose in life only involves taking care of yourself, you've missed the point of your life. You're like, wow, you're just shooting us on both sides. Yes. Yes, I am. Ben, why your passion? Because I've lived both ways. I've not taken care of myself, and I couldn't be a good husband, I couldn't be a good father, I couldn't be a good pastor, all the things. But I've got to remember that self-care for me isn't the end of the game. It is a means to living out the purpose that God has called me to this earth for. So they get to the other side. Jesus has brought the disciples to this remote place, and when they get there, there's a large crowd there. Please raise your hand if you can relate. You have finished an exhausting day or series of days. You finally have some downtime, and then someone makes another ask of you. Anybody besides me not have the compassion that's present in Jesus here on those moments? I'm like, uh-uh, I can't do it. I said, uh-uh. So literally, Jesus told them, let's get away. You guys don't even have time to be, let's get away. How do we know that self-care wasn't the end in itself for Jesus? How do you know that? Here's how you know it, because the text does not say, when Jesus saw a large crowd, he was so frustrated and angry. No, when Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion. If self-obsession or self-absorption would have been the goal for Jesus, compassion would have been the last emotion present in him at this moment. Would you agree? But he recognizes, even as they land exhausted, these guys are like sheep without a shepherd. They've got no one to lead them. They've got no one to guide them. They've got no one to teach them. They've got no one to provide for them. And I wonder, I wonder as the disciples are watching what Jesus is going to do, like is he going to send the crowd away right then? Is he going to just say, hey, let's stay in the boat and go the other way? That's probably how I would have played it. Sorry, guys, we didn't see you there. But there's 20,000 of us. I know, my eyesight is bad. But he lets the disciples know they're sheep without a shepherd. And as I think about these Jewish disciples, I wonder if in that moment they started to recall the shepherd's psalm. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for 
Yeah, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup's not just full. It overflows. Surely, your goodness, if I'll let it, and your love, if I'll let it, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So Jesus and the disciples, even though they're trying to get away and rest, they deny themselves rest to take care of these thousands of people. But even Jesus knows that can't go on forever. So I want you to see what happens post-feeding of the 5,000. In verses 45 and 46, they've just fed 5,000 men plus all the women and all the children. And the text reads, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. He made the disciples. He makes me lie down in green pastures. If we don't choose to do it, there may be an event happen in our medical condition or with our job or with our family or something else where he just makes us do it. Let's opt into it before we're made to do it. He made the disciples disengage, disengage from the crowd, disengage from the ministry, disengage from the miracle moment. And then I love this, what Jesus has just prescribed for the disciples and for you and me, he actually does it himself. He leaves the crowd. He goes to the solitary place on the mountain and he's there alone, dot, 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 to be with the Father because he knew this was the same way he could sustain his mission and his mission mattered and he couldn't fizzle out when it was go time on the cross. Would you agree? So he had these rhythms. Luke 5, he often withdrew to these kind of places. He made it a frequent thing in his life. How frequent are you disengaging so that you can more fully engage as a parent, as a boss, as an employee, as a leader here at Epic Church? Do your rhythm stand the likelihood of sustaining you for the next few decades? I'm not playing just for my 40s. I'm playing for the end of it. So I want rhythms right now. I want rhythms right now that allow me to be your pastor as long as God calls me to it. And I don't have to bow out because I didn't take care of myself or because I became so selfish or because I gave in to something that wasn't good for me because I was exhausted all the time. I want to go the distance. Anybody else? Six of you. The rest of you are tapping out. As we see Jesus teach us about compassion, the compassion we should have for others like he did, what is he teaching us about his heart towards us? What is he teaching me and you about his posture towards us? Let me tell you what he's teaching us. He's teaching you that you're not a bother to him. He's teaching you that he's not too consumed with other things to pay great attention to you. He's teaching you that he's not too tired and he's not too hungry to still have compassion on you. He's teaching you that when you feel weak and like you're never going to get your game or your act together, he's still showing up and he's bringing a full sense of compassion. He's like, I know, I am here for you. This is what good shepherds do. Would you agree? John 10, 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, even when he's tired, even when he's sad, even when he's hungry, even when it leads him to the cross. The one who has called you to his mission in the world is the one who wants to sustain you. And before he calls you to go and care for everyone else, he wants you to see how much he's caring for you. I think about 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I think about Jesus showing up exhausted right here with the crowd, seeing the crowd and not trying to get away from the crowd. He was filled with compassion. And his compassion is going out to you today. I want to ask you just to take a posture of prayer. You can close your eyes. You can open your hands. You can kneel. Whatever it is that you feel led to do. But I really do want to address three different kinds of people in this moment as we think about what Jesus has come to do and what we need to respond to him with. As you hear that word that Jesus is a good shepherd who lays down his life for us, 
I believe that there are people watching online or here in this room who today needs to be the day for the first time in your life you receive the life of Jesus that was laid down for you. If you would say, Ben, yeah, today's the day. Today's the day I want to learn how to live by faith in Jesus. Would you just lift a hand so I could pray for you personally? Today's the day I want to live by faith in Jesus. Awesome. And for you, it's just simply uttering a prayer like this one. Jesus, I see that you love me and you gave your life for me and I receive that life today. Please let us know that you've done that. You can fill out the card and just say, hey, put my faith in Jesus today. I want to know how to follow him. The next group of people I want to ask a question to is the group that, let's be honest, you are living life at a pace that's not sustainable. Somewhere along the way, if you keep this up, you're going to lose your way. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your health. You're perhaps going to even lose your vocation if things don't change. Anyone honest enough, and I've been here so many times myself, where you would just say, yeah, if I don't get a handle on this pace, I'm in jeopardy and so are the people around me. Would you just lift a hand that I might pray for you? It's something we all struggle with. Yeah, thank you for your honesty. And for you, here's the prayer I want to offer. Jesus, you know what you've given us to do in this world. Jesus, you know what it takes to sustain every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room. Would you help us get in the rhythms that will enable us to endure in the mission you've got for our lives over the long term? God, it starts, I believe, with faith, trusting you that when we disengage, you still hold the world up and you still hold our vocation up. God, give us a sustainable pace. Give us the rhythms that matter. And then the third group I want to ask is this question. You're actually really good at self-care. And I applaud you for that. But, but is it possible that your self-care has turned into self-obsession? It's turned into selfish ambition. It's turned into only caring about yourself. Anybody just say, hey, I do struggle with that. I actually have good rhythms, but I've got to make sure I actually care for other people. Anyone that I could pray for with that today? Yeah, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the honesty. Jesus, remind us that though you care for us, we don't exist for ourselves. So may the rhythms that we've already established, could they be about being healthy, being full of your life and love and compassion so that we might go and live out the mission you have for us. You can open your eyes. I'm, I'm going to let you know we're about to walk into a, a worship response song, but also a time of communion. And so in just a moment, I'm going to pray. Seth and the team will start leading us. And there's a few different spots for you to grab a communion packet that we're using now in light of just all that we've been in. Um, there are gluten-free packets, just so you know, at all three stations. But during this song, as we're worshiping, just go ahead and grab this, but hold on to it. I'd love for us to be able to, as I come back on stage, to observe the elements together. And so go ahead and stand. I'm going to pray for us. You can move. It, this is for Christians, just to be clear. Even if you became a Christian today, which we celebrate, this is for those of us who know that our life is found in Jesus. And as you think about the message from today and this experience of the communion elements, three things I'd love for you to consider. Number one, just thank Jesus for laying his life down for you. Number two, thank him for caring for you way beyond just forgiving you of your sins. He's a good shepherd. But then number three, why don't we link this part of the message. Jesus, because you've cared for me, I can go and care for others. While this is very personal between you and Jesus, this is never just supposed to end with you and Jesus. We want to be poured out for the world just like he was. So Jesus, would you receive our worship? Would you help us to trust you that the one who laid his life down for us is the shepherd who cares for us and provides pasture for us and leads us beside quiet waters? so that as you care for us, we might go and care for others that you've called us to. 
receive our worship. It's in your name we pray. Amen.